Right, I'll get right to the point. There's been a murder. Had to say that. My name's Mark McManus. Tag it. So, yes, there's been a murder. So, consolidation of colleges across Scotland. Um, and you've been murdering our cloud services across Scotland, England, and Wales. We now have over 14 million registrations into our Office 365 environment. 14 million registrations. That's staff uh, and students across uh, Scotland, England, and Wales, which I think is amazing. Uh, so hopefully, who of, you, who of you are using 365? All of you out there? Wow. Okay, so. Pardon? A little bit. Nearly, you're nearly there. Fantastic. Well, maybe you can talk about that later. That's fantastic. Yes, you want the names of that college. So th thank you for attending today. Really do appreciate it. My name is genuinely Mark McManus. Um, I don't know if I've got any relation to Taggett, but um, uh, hopefully uh, well, things will move on quickly. We've got over here Alan Woods, who's our, um, our academic account manager for Scotland. So yes, he's our, he's our man in terms of account management. And I support Alan in terms of cloud services. So I cover education, schools, universities, colleges, talking about cloud services and the benefits thereof. So those of you who are using 365, thank you very much. That's fantastic. Hopefully, and I always hesitate to ask this question, getting lots of benefits out of it. Stun silence. <laughs> yes, yes, some nods. Yeah, OK, so no, no bottles through my way. So that was uh, as a good sign. So yes, yeah, so we've, 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 things have moved on a year since uh, I was last at this conference. And I thought I'd go through some of the enhancements that we've made. Just sort of cover it, obviously, from Microsoft's point of view. Cloud is our key focus area. We want to be number one in cloud services across sector. Make no bones about that. And it's a cloud-first strategy from our new CEO, Satyana Nadella, which has uh, been appointed since we last spoke. Uh, and he's very much into cloud. And uh, all the services that we produce, there will be feature parity between what we produce on-premises compared to what we produce in the cloud. Uh, and we see it very much as a way for our customers to save money, to be able to consolidate, to really focus on what you do as organizations. I love the phrase, and I think I said it last year, but I don't, I don't mind repeating it. Complexity stifles innovation. And in an academic environment, that's not a good thing. And we found where IT has become a little bit too complex, it's become too involved, there aren't enough people to run it, that's kind of stifling innovation and academic sites moving forward. And so with cloud services, it gives us an opportunity to reduce some of that complexity in the local environment. We'll look after that for you. You get to do what you're really about, which is about innovations and teaching and learning. It's about getting involved with the students, helping them, helping the staff to use technology in a way that enhances teaching and learning, rather than getting embroiled in patching and servicing and all the other stuff that we, we tend to do. So it's about having a, an enterprise cloud system, an enterprise grade cloud system. And if any of you have seen the picture of our data centers, they're massive, huge places. A lot of them have these containers. And these containers are full of kit. And they are containers literally that you would see on a wagon traveling down the road or on a ship. And they are full of kit. And we treat them like RAID devices. Are you familiar with RAID technology? So in a file server, you'll have five hard disk drives. If a hard disk drive fails, you unplug one drive. The system continues. You plug in a new one. There's no interruption of service. We do that with containers. We unplug a container if it reaches a critical level of failure, and we plug a new one in without failure of service. And from your perspective, there isn't a rusting container in the corner peeling paint. That's for academia. It's the same service. So you're sharing the service with our commercial customers, our central government customers. It's exactly the same service. So you're benefiting from those levels of technology as well as those levels of security and compliance. And so we feel it's a really good proposition for our academic customers. So, so Office 365, for those of you who may not know what 365 is, 365 is our software as a service. It runs in our data centers. In Europe, that means Dublin and Amsterdam. And it's our platform for collaboration and productivity. Uh, sometimes I think Office 365 is the wrong name for it because people see the name Microsoft Office, they think Word, Excel, PowerPoint, 
OneNote, etc. And certainly that's a module that's part of the service, but it's so much more. These are the key components of Office 365. Enterprise class email service with Exchange. It is Exchange at the back end, which is our product name for email. Offering 50 gigabytes of mailbox per individual. Full calendaring service. And pre-integrated with all the other servers that you see up there. So it is enterprise class email service running in the cloud that you can deliver to your clients, your students, your customers, your staff. SharePoint Online is our internet service. But so much more, it provides personalized storage space, uh, group storage space for teachers, for lecturers, for research groups, for programs, for management, etc. Workflow, document management, revisioning, there's a whole product environment there that you can develop. And this is probably the richest part of the whole 365 environment, is the SharePoint Online. We can develop internal intranet sites, there's one for every Office 365 environment that we call a tenancy. There's one external facing domain that you can have for uh, perhaps parents or uh, partner associations to come in or as a standard open website for your college or academic university, whatever it may be. I can share documents and built into this environment also is the ability to use Word, Excel, PowerPoint and OneNote in a browser across any device. So regardless of where I am, regardless of, sorry, let me just uh, uh, get rid of that. Regardless of what device I'm on, I can edit documents, I can create documents. I don't have to have the full office suite on the device to do that. And I'll show you that later in a, in a quick demonstration. And that's all part of the SharePoint online environment. Link online gives us instant messaging. You, those of you at the presentation beforehand from BT, um, they were telling you about Link and uh, all the available features in there, but basically it's real-time collaboration. Instant messaging, high-definition video, audio, whiteboard sessions, desktop uh, sharing, file transfer, all built within the same service and integrated with all the other services in Office 365. So very powerful in terms of real-time collaboration. We have colleges, universities, schools using it for um, management teams conferencing together, uh, te specialist teachers or lecturers who are in one class sharing the class with another via the link service. Uh, we have schools in Derby using it for uh, homework. The teachers offer an extra hour in the evening for pupils who are struggling with their homework and they, they join in a conference call and the teacher gives them a little bit of extra service. We've got universities allowing students to record lectures on their own devices using Link. So there's lots of use cases that we wouldn't even think of uh, that are being used in the academic space. And more recently, uh, in fact just this month, we've introduced Yammer. So I was working at a college not so long ago and they said, actually, uh, most of the students coming in have never used email or don't want to use email. They're used to Facebook and Twitter. But we don't want to use that because it's security issues and a little bit too open for us. And so Yammer provides, think Facebook and Twitter, and I'll show you a, a, a demonstration of that later. So it's a social interface. Uh, so where you can hashtag and follow and all these cool words, etc., that we can use. Uh, a lecturer could put up a document and students could follow the document. Uh, videos can be put up there. Uh, and that's all integrated within the 365 environment. So it's within the secure confines of the college or the academic site. Now, sometimes I was at the same college and they said, yes, students just come into the college, don't use email, want to use a social interface. Our staff just got used to using email. And so how do we bridge the gap? And so because these services are pre-integrated, if a lecturer gets hashtag followed, uh, then the lecturer will get an email. The lecturer replies, it goes back into the social interface. So there's a bridge between the two environments to help those who are perhaps not so up on social networking. So it's all built in, it's all configured, it's all pre-integrated within that environment. Hopefully, those of you using that environment are gaining those benefits. Also built into this platform that we're using, the collaboration and productivity, is the ability to deliver the office suite to local machines. So we're using it as a delivery service. So rather than clogging up your servers 
with, this, with, with delivery of the Office suite, we can do that from our platform uh, to multiple devices, to Macs, obviously PCs and tablets, to Android devices, and to iPads now with Office for iPad. And so let's just have a little talk about what the actual enhancements are since last year. So this time last year, the email box was 25 gigabytes. We increased that last August to 50 gigabytes. Anybody on the service would see that uplift. Uh, anybody new would get that immediately. 50 gigabytes email box for staff and students. We've just recently increased the OneDrive space. This is the personal storage area for our staff and students to store their files and their assignments and homework, et cetera, et cetera, to one terabyte per person. Yes, one terabyte. Oh, yeah. One terabyte. That was one terabyte. Did you get that? One terabyte of personalized storage uh, per individual. And that's on top of the third element of storage, which is for shared areas. For every individual registered to the Office 365 environment, we contribute 500 megabytes of storage to a central pool that your administrators can then allocate to classes, to lecturers, to management teams for collaboration, sharing documents, uh, sharing ideas, etc. Uh, so the storage space beneath that, so I was at a, a university yesterday, they have 40,000 staff and students, so that's 20 terabytes of storage space they have for that environment for shared. That's on top of the one terabyte on top of the 50 gigabytes. So we're giving away an awful lot. And by the way, everything that I'm talking about is free for staff and students. There is no charge for all of this for staff and students. Just giving away. So like I said, it's murder on our, um, on our uh, cloud services. Also, what we announced last December was, I feel like a politician. I mean, what we announced, last uh, we announced last December, Student Advantage. Student Advantage is a program for all students in the country, in schools, colleges, universities, that enables the institution, the college, the school, the university, to deliver the full office suite to the student devices at no extra cost. There is no charge for that from Microsoft. Anybody knew about that, by the way? Let me just put your hands up if you knew about that. OK, using it? Yes? Mm -hmm. Using that? No? OK, so again, something that you can offer to your student base in terms of enhancing the student experience, delivering the full office suite to up to five of their own devices. Laptops, PCs, the home machine, so the family can then benefit from that service. Mobile devices, and of course, recently we announced Office for iPad. It includes Office for iPad. So that's an amazing service, we believe, for students in some of the universities, colleges, schools who are using it have had an immediate positive response from the students in, in, in being able to get that. Um, there's two caveats. As always, we have a few caveats. There has to be an Office 365 environment in place because that's the platform we're using to deliver it. And two, the academic site has to have their FTE licensed for Office, which 99.99% of academic institutions in the country have that already. So more than likely, you will qualify for that if you don't already have it. So it's at no cost, we're not charging for that. All students can get five copies. And plus, plus it's five copies of mobile stuff. So for Android and uh, iPhone devices as well, on top of that. So it's an amazing offer, we hope. It's a full-time offer, it's a program, it's not an offer. Should have said offer. I usually get slammed if I get said offer. It's a permanent fixture. We're not removing it, it's permanent. In addition to that, as I said, we, we introduced Yammer which is the social networking. We bought the organization Yammer last year, early last year, uh, and we've incorporated that now into the 365 environment. Uh, and moving further down the line, we'll integrate that with email, we'll integrate that with SharePoint. Uh, right now you get single sign-on into the Yammer environment. It's the full enterprise version of Yammer. It's not the free introduction version. It's the full enterprise version but contained within your 365 environment. Full social interface. Working with a council at the moment where they're saying, well, actually, we're having some issues 
With bullying and people emailing each other, it means that the administrators have to go into the student's account to check the emails, what's being said, what's being sent. Bit of an overhead for us. They're thinking of scrapping email and using a social interface. So it's more open, people can see what's going on, what's going on in the communications. Perhaps a little bit controversial, but that's what they're thinking of doing, is introducing the social interface only for exchange of information. And using this social interface, this Yama, this Facebook, Twitter type environment, it's really interesting because it opens up information flow. Uh, I, Mark McManus, would not email Satyella Nandela, the CEO of Microsoft, and ask him a question about the strategy of Microsoft. Politically, probably not sound to do. However, in the Yammer service, Satyella Nandela is part of all sorts of different groups. And if I ask a question, he may answer the question. So it breaks down political barriers and allows information to flow quicker to the people who need it. So it's very interesting in terms of information flow and the political structure of the organization. It allows that flow of information as to where. And the larger we get in terms of collaboration, the more that information flow happens. So maybe uh, federating with other colleges, this consolidation of colleges having a single Yammer service uh, may help in terms of information flow, lecturers helping other lecturers, IT staff helping other IT staff, management staff, etc. It's, it's an ideal format and medium in, in which to do that, but contained within 365. It's not open to the outside world. And then just on that uh, note of, co of um, consolidation, we've increased the level of allowable vanity domains, if you like. So personalized ac.uk domains for colleges, for schools, for universities. So per 365 environment, it's now 900. So you can have 900 different entities or 900 different vanity domains for different email addresses, for different sites internally, etc. So that colleges um, don't lose their identity or autonomy. So they still have their I identity within the 365 environment. We have colleges I'm working with at the moment who are opening up their 365 service to schools, to feeder schools. So where the schools can't perhaps manage this environment because this is still a hosted environment. It's still a managed and hosted environment. It has to be administered. It has to be set up. The policies have to be created. Um, and so colleges are kind of offering that to schools, charging the schools for that administration, but benefiting from the fact that those schools are now part of their system. Cross collaboration, information flow, etc. So again, something that may be of interest uh, as, I'm develop as, we're, as we're developing those ideas. So there's some of the key enhancements that we've made. There've been other enhancements, there's been literally hundreds of enhancements over the last year to the cloud service and to the academic environment. So everything there, is no charge. There's no charge for all of that. We've also, the one I forgot to mention was Project Online. Anybody using Project Online at all? So that's part of the free service. I'll show you a demonstration of that a little bit later, a few screens. Uh, so that we're, we've got a large university in the north uh, east of England using this for project portfolio management. So typically, managing lots of projects, bit of a pain, got files on local on uh, the project manager's local machine. Um, he or she's trying to manage lots of different projects, uh, trying to collate and where everybody is up to the tasks, typically down to email, etc. Project online enables me to do that in a centralized service. Um, individuals who are part of the project can update their tasks and their assignments, uh, respond to notifications on any device. All they need is a browser-based device and internet access. All project files can be remain centralized with version control and document management built into it. I can see a Gantt chart, and I'll show you that a little bit later. But that's part of the free service, uh, and I'll show you where you can get that as well. So that, that's, again, an, an extra enhancement that we added over the last year. Uh, project Pro Plus is the actual module name that we're giving to students. This is the ability to download the full version of Office to local clients. Macs, PCs, um, Office for iPads, etc. So the idea is Office apps on any device delivered from Office 365. And of course, have to mention it, Office for iPad is included in that. So looks and feels familiar, hopefully that you know and love the Office environment, uh, but enhanced for touch, obviously being on an iPad. 
So, and it's, it's had some very good reviews. Uh, you can download the read-only version from the iTunes website, etc. But the only way you can get the create version is through an Office 365 account. And as I say, for students, we're offering that for free through their institutional login. They can download this to their iPad service. And that's what student advantage is, as I say. It's delivering that whole suite to up to five devices, plus five mobile devices. So really good. So that was Office 365. Any questions on Office 365 while I'm here? I'm going to move on to Azure next. Any questions at all? One question there, Jen. Right, yes, so the, the question is, so that's for students. We're giving it away for students at no extra cost. For staff, it is chargeable. Uh, and there's two ways of doing that. You can either uh, subscribe to the staff version of this, which is Office Pro for staff. Uh, and, that, and that's at a cost of approximately £1.65, depending on your relationship with your reseller. So it's £1.65 per staff member per month over the year. There's another way of, of purchasing it. You can purchase it, uh, move to the academic. So that everything I've talked about now, uh, up until now, has been under the academic A2 plan. There is an academic A3 plan you can move up to, and it provides further enhancements. And one of those enhancements is the Office Pro Plus for staff is included in it. However, it also includes unlimited archiving in the email. So mentioned before, 50 gigabyte email box in the free version, in the academic A3 version, it's unlimited archiving. There's no limitations. Also, in the, un in the uh, A3 version, you can encrypt email. So staff to staff, staff to parents, you can encrypt the email. Staff to council, if that's relevant. Um, college to college, you can encrypt the email. That's part of that service as well. Uh, as is information rights management. So a staff member could encrypt an individual file, a Word document, an Excel document, whatever it may be, and if that file finds itself outside of the institutional environment on any device, if somebody then tries to open it, it will call back itself to the 365 environment. And unless they've got an account and the relevant rights, they won't be able to open the file. It's encrypted. The individual file is encrypted. It's called information rights management. That's part of A3. Also, data loss prevention. So if somebody tries to email something or send something out from the SharePoint environment outside of your, the confines of your organization, it will flag it with you as an individual, flag it with the administrator, and stop you sending that information out, whether that's personal information. You set the criteria in terms of what personal, secure information is. And it will stop it from going outside the environment. That's called data loss prevention. That's built into the A3 environment as well. So there's an awful lot in A3. Now, depending on your licensing locally, you can get that four pence cheaper than Office Pro Plus. So it's worth going for that. It depends on your licensing. We have step-up discounts. So if you've got licensing locally with Microsoft and you want to use the A3 plan for some of your staff, um, then you can say, well, actually, we'll get the step-up discount. And that, could, that reduces that price down to 160 odd per staff member per month. And you can have as minimum as one or however many you want. So, for instance, I'm working with a university where they said, well, actually, our legal department, they want to encrypt emails, uh, they want to do e uh, legal e discovery, which is another function of A3, across the whole environment. You can search individual modules, but e discovery for legal requests. Uh, whether it's the police or whoever, you can do a complete legal search across the whole environment. Link, SharePoint, Exchange, Yammer, it will do a complete legal search. And so for their legal department, they, they're setting 10 of their staff up for A3. They don't have to do all of them, just the 10 of those A3. So again, it's worth looking at that. So hopefully, does that answer your question? A bit of an elongated answer, but there's, there's two options. You can just get Office Pro Plus, which delivers Office Pro to the staff members, five devices, five mobiles, etc. Or you can go to A3, which might be cheaper with more functionality. Another question. So then. A3, you get to choose who to give it to. First option, we'll just do that for all staff base, or can you choose who to give it to? Yes, that's a good point. So the question was, uh, with, with A3, you get to choose 
who you deliver it to. It could be one person, it could be 10, it could be everybody. You choose how many you want. With Office Pro Plus for staff, you have to do it for all. It's all or nothing. And that's a key difference. So therefore, the A3, depending on licensing, is cheaper, and depending on who you need to give it to, it's a cheaper option, generally. Does that answer your question? Excellent. Any other questions around Office 365? We'll move on. We'll, we'll talk later if you want to catch me later. So moving on to Azure. So that's our, what we've talked about is Office 365, which is our brand name for software as a service. We also have infrastructure as a service, platform as a service. And over the last year, we've seen a significant rise in the amount of academic institutions signing up to this for disaster recovery, for backups, for extra storage, for virtual machines, um, all sorts of things. It's a massive data center. It's our data centers in the cloud that you can use. So spinning up compute power, storage space, long term or short term. And then we only charge for what you use. So it's, it's worth looking at. It's pooled resources, obviously. Self-service, I can spin up a resource in literally minutes. So I was at a university yesterday and they were saying that the research department was saying, well, you know, it takes too long for the IT services to get things up and running for us. So we go off and buy it ourselves. Now, obviously there's benefits commercially if they use the central fund, because you, you collaborate all your funds, you have bet better agreements with vendors, but sometimes researchers can't wait for two, three months before something's set up. So this, having a cloud service, even if it's only a temporary um, stopgap till you get something done locally, I can literally spin up 10 terabytes in minutes. I could spin up virtual machines in minutes and, and give a sub-allocate management of that to the lecturer or whoever needs that resource. And then when I've got it done locally, I can bring it back in again. So it gives IT services that extra level of flexibility to say, well, actually, I can give you 10 terabytes tomorrow. I can give you extra compute power now. Just give me a cost code and away we go, if you work by cost codes, et cetera. So it does give you that extra flexibility. It is usage-based. Usage it's elastic. I can push it out to the cloud, certain peaks and around the year, and then when it hit the troughs, I can pull it back in again, saving money. Talking to universities especially um, around testing and development. So testing and development, they're pushing this into the cloud. And one of the questions I asked them is, does testing and development need to be on 24 by 7, seven days a week? Typically it is because it's part of their existing infrastructure. But when I push it to the cloud, do I really need testing and development? So okay, there might be some overnight testing I need to do for two or three days or whatever. If you make that the exception rather than the rule. So eight o'clock every night, the whole system closes down automatically. Six o'clock in the morning, it spins up again. I don't use it over weekends unless there's an exception to do so. That way I can, I can save an extra 40% on the costs of cloud just by doing that. It's becoming utility. Computing is a utility service. I turn it on when I want it, I turn it off when I don't. If it's not turned on, I don't get charged for it. It gives all sorts of possibilities in terms of the budgets that you have. Of course, it makes it flexible. If you buy a load of 10 for a particular project, beginning of the project, you might need more compute than storage. The end, you might be the reverse. And typically, if you've invested, you have to buy more storage. You can't trade in your old hardware for new, typically. In cloud, you can do that. You can turn off what you don't want, turn on some more stuff. doesn't affect. It's significantly more flexible. But the idea, one of the key mandates from Microsoft, and perhaps a key differentiator, is that we hybrid. We can link all of this stuff with your environment. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. So it's all about the economics of it. It is cheaper. Costs have been tumbling over the last year. Uh, between the giants, the Amazon, the Google, Microsoft, we've been competing. Costs have tumbled. And as we spread and have more and more data centers, improve the efficiency of the data centers, then we pass the economies of scale back to our customers as well. Gives you the agility. It means, as I said before, that you focus on what you're about, which is teaching and learning, and not the complexities of patching, servicing, and running. We look after that. Those servers, we look after the patching, and the services, and the hardware, and the hardware failures, and the high availability. We look after all of that. Disaster recovery, we'll look after that. And of course, the electricity, we're doing it. So it's a tick in the box from your perspective for the green agenda because you're offloading that onto us. 
So it makes a, a lot of sense. We've got data centers around the world, as I say. In Europe, we've got two, Dublin and Amsterdam. So it's contained data protection laws, EU privacy laws, model clauses, etc., etc. And because this is the same service as we use with commercial organizations, medical, central government, academia benefits from the compliance that we have to do for all of them as well. Independently verified by ISO 27001, etc., etc. And we work with Janet, who go through all our terms and conditions to ensure that we are adhering to local data protection laws, European laws, etc., etc. So it's all part of the overall system and spreading. We're opening what we just opened one in South America. I think somebody was a football fan. We have to be in South America over summer. So, but we just opened one in South America and China. There's data centers all over the world. But the two that we have in Europe, Dublin and Amsterdam. And so it's shared responsibility. So on the left-hand side, everything in green is on-premises. You're looking after it from the networking. And of course, underneath the network, you've got the space, the electricity as well. As you move to the right, infrastructure as a service, then we look after the space, the electricity, the networking, the storage, the servers, the virtualization layer. And then you look after the operating system up. As we get to platform as a service, this is where we look after your applications. You deliver the application. You deliver the data. We look after everything underneath it. And then we get to software as a service. Might be your own application you bring, or Microsoft's applications, like Exchange, like SharePoint, that we've talked about with 365. We look after everything. But you manage it. You manage it as though it's on your premises. You have full administration rights, customization rights, etc to manage the whole environment. So it's a shared responsibility between us and you, depending on the workloads. So it's all about one consistent platform, regardless of whether it's on-premise, private cloud, or public cloud. We see it as one OS now. And with some of the services that we have, we could literally get to the point where you've got virtual machines running, critical services, they start to hit certain utilization, we'll start spinning up the equivalent application in the cloud to take on the extra utilization. When that drops, we'll pull it back again can all be automated. And from your user's perspective, they see no change. It's transparent to them. It's part of your data center. We can make the cloud look as though it's part of your data center. And of course, if we want to be number one in cloud, we can't just do Microsoft stuff. And so it's supporting in terms of language a lot more than just .NET environment. You've got PHP and Python, et cetera, up there. Uh, we've got. Um, all sorts of devices that we can support. It's not just about endpoint Microsoft devices. Apple, it's Android, etc. Databases, more than just Microsoft databases, and operating systems, Linux, and Microsoft at the moment. We've even got Oracle up there now. Oracle databases can run up there. We broke an agreement with Oracle, which was, I thought was amazing. So some of the numbers, there's more compute power in our data centers alone than there was in the world in 1999 and increasing literally on a daily basis. We buy tens of thousands of servers per month and equipment, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we could give 10 megabytes to everybody in China. And this, this was last year's slide, so it's changed since then, especially with the one terabyte of uh, storage we're offering to everybody at the moment. So you can imagine the numbers. that These data centers are huge, broken down typically into three core elements, application services, data services, and infrastructure services. The application service, as the name implies, we can run a third-party application up there, your own application, support the development of that with languages, etc., and all everything that's to do with ap applications, whether that's caching, identity, uh, media control, we've got all that. Data services, that's data storage. Everybody's got data storage issues. We can put storage in the cloud, significantly lower costs. Uh, and use it up there. And infrastructure services so we can have virtual network. We can have a virtual network connection between our data center and yours. You can use your subnet, your IP address, your DNS servers. It looks as though it's part of your data center. So it gives you that flexibility. Bring all them together, you've got nice data center, virtual data center, in effect, that you can use. Just wanted to introduce you to a, a concept. We bought an organization uh, almost two years ago called Store Simple. And this is cloud integrated storage. So on the theme of hybrid, of mixing environments together. And what this is, is local data storage. And I'll go into that in a moment. So typically, the issues with storage, we get 
equipment sprawl, we get lots and lots of, you know, there's more requests for storage. Storage goes up rather than down year on year. Um, we get huge amounts of increase in the, the footprint of our the services and the kit that we need to use it. The backups become more and more of an issue. There's all sorts of issues with de uh, untested disaster recovery because there's so much of the stuff. And yet, how much of it is actually used? All the storage space that we provide to our students and staff, how much is actually used on a daily basis is the question. So today, it's typically, even with the tumbling costs of storage, it's still quite complex and expensive to manage and use. Now, let's just switch to what we said before in terms of data. It's growing exponentially, more than 50 to 60% annually. Would you agree with that? Data storage, data requests, we need more and more yearly. And yet, in reality, what's the data set that we actually use? The usage incline is not as much. And so we have cloud storage opportunity for stuff that's what we call cold data. It's not used that regularly. Potentially, we could move that to the cloud and keep data sets that are used on a local basis. So looking at Azure cloud storage, we've got seven trillion objects up there. There's, there's a huge amounts of data storage up there. And whenever we store anything from a customer in Azure, we get three copies at least in one data center. And there's an option then to replicate that to the next data center. So we've got geographical replication between the two data centers in Europe. So three copies in one, three copies in another. That's done automatically. You don't have to think about that, it's done for you. So what if we could bring those two areas together? And so what we have is an actual appliance. It's a hardware appliance. It's localized storage. It sits within your environment. It's got a fast level. It's got uh, tiered storage. So it's got SSDs at the top end. It's got shared drives, uh, so, sorry, storage drives. And then within the box, it begins as data becomes less and less used, based on your criteria, it begins to deduplicate the data, compress the data, and ultimately it'll push it out to the cloud, to Azure, and store it there. Leaving all the stubs locally, if somebody calls that file set, whatever it may be, it's then pulled back from the cloud into the box, and away they get access to it. So it's this hybrid of localized storage, fast access to storage, but with archive, automated archive to cloud through tiered steps, deduplication, compression, and ultimately it will encrypt the data and send it over and store it encrypt, encrypted. So again, it's about this hybrid technology between. That's a nice start in terms of storage. So this is what it is. It's cloud integrated storage. It can manage, you can manage up to 60 to 80% total cost of ownership, less than, than normal storage because it's using cloud, which is significantly lower in cost, et cetera. So it's uh, supported by VMware as well as Microsoft. We can put backups on there, um, unstructured data, et cetera. There's an awful lot of stuff that we can do with this box. Uh, and so just taking us through, as the data comes into the main SSD layer, the fastest storage stays there. If people are using it within your criteria on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, whatever it may be, it stays in that layer. As the data becomes cold, it starts dropping down the layers into the drives, etc. We deduplicate the data, we compress the data, and then ultimately it will get sent to the cloud. If somebody calls it, it comes back up to the layers and is made available to the individuals. Cloud integrated architecture, hybrid storage between local on premise and cloud services. We'll make sure there's a copy of these slides available so you can go through this. We can do replication between one site and another, so disaster recovery between boxes. And we can do backups as well, so we can take snapshots of data and push that up into the cloud and have it stored in the cloud as a backup copy. Faster, much more efficient, less space locally, less electricity used without losing that fast access to data uh, in the local box. So a comparison on the left is traditional storage, data protection architecture, compared to on the right. Um, and so traditional, the capex for building what's on the left and the support is 240K, support 48K. Uh, we've currently got an offer on, we get the box for free. So there's no capex for the box. 
You're just paying for the Azure, which you can use for any service besides storage, so it's significantly less. Uh, and that's a cost comparison between the two. So that's a summary of cloud integrated storage. Again, another concept from Microsoft um, based on our hybrid story between the service. Other workloads we talked about, authentication and RMS. So people with 365, uh, if you're using Active Directory federated services, you're using federated services for single sign-on for Active Directory. Now, typically, that's on-premise. And so therefore, you have to make it highly available, a number of boxes, because if that's not available, even though 365 is in the cloud, uh, if that's not available, your ADFS service, people don't log in. We're using your local authentication, your directory service to get logged into the service. So what we've seen over the past year is sites beginning to move that into the cloud to make it highly available. So we can put ADFS in the cloud, domain controller, link that with your local domain controller. You've got highly available uh, federated services and at a lower cost year on year. Again, electricity costs, the power of the, the, the virtual machines, et cetera. And so we've got more and more sites using that for higher availability of the federated services. Uh, big data as a service, so crunching lots of data. Um, we've got the Hadoop service that's built into that, which is open source, uh, that enables us to crunch an awful lot of data. And then general storage as well. Video encoding. Mention the virtual network. This is the idea that I can connect the data center and the virtual machines you've created, the storage, et cetera, to your data center using your IP addresses, et cetera. So it looks as though it's part of your data center. So you can stretch out your data center into Microsoft's. When you don't need it, pull it back again. It gives you that flexibility to use huge amounts of compute over short periods of time if you wanted to. Uh, UCAS is uh, one of the, a good example. They do their clearing service literally over a day, and they get millions of hits. And the infrastructure they needed for that is huge. I used to work for the organization that used to hire them that. They used to hire it two months in advance, set it up for a month, prepare it, and then break it all down again. It used to cost them a lot of money to do that. Now they use cloud services to do that at a significantly lower cost. And if there's, if there's too many hits at the same time, the cloud service just ramps up the compute it needs to do that. And then they close it down. So for the rest of the year, they don't, they don't get charged for it. It's just that one period of time per year. So yeah, blob storages, lots of different storage types. Mobile devices, I was speaking to one academic organization where they said, we spend 20%, if we create a, a new browser-based application, we spend 20% of the time on the application and the rest of the time making sure it formats right on all the different devices that the students have. And so what we have is something called mobile services that does that for you. You can plug your new application into this, it will format your, docu your application for the, for the devices that everybody uses. We've got video transcoding, we can do file, uh, the, and the uh, Olympics we use this, this was used in the Olympics, so video transmission, video transcoding, streaming, etc. that's built into the Azure service. There's literally tens of services available in Azure, lots and lots of services. Um, I won't go through them all because I'm running out of time, but thank you very much. That was an overview of cloud services within the time we had. Any questions quickly? For Alan and myself. Thank you very much. Uh, I've got a microphone here if anyone wants to ask any questions at all. No? You all just wanted just to run away for, for lunch? Can I just say a couple of words? First yeah. of all, Mark, thank you very much for the, the opportunity yes, to come, true, come yes. and present. Um, my name's Alan Wood, so I'm the, uh, I'm the account manager for education in Scotland. Uh, my email address is awood at microsoft.com. Um, hopefully that's given you a flavour of, of some of the uh, some of the opportunity there is to solve some of the business challenges you've got. What's interesting for me uh, in Microsoft is the amount of innovation that comes out of Microsoft is incredible, but it's really only applicable if it's, a, if it's aligned to some of the business challenges that you've got. Now, I know in the, the college se sector there's a huge amount of consolidation. I talk to colleges all the time who are facing all manner of, of, of challenges. Um, we've got the technology to resolve, I think, just about all of those challenges, but we need to talk about that. Uh, we have a facility in our Waverly Gate <coughs> office called the Customer Immersion Experience. Has anyone been to the Customer Immersion Experience yet in the room? Okay, so I want to personally invite you to come along to that. 
Um, if you get in touch with me through my email address, um, I'll invite you into to Edinburgh to, to go through this. The CIE is a, a non-technical way we can explore some of the, um, some of the more um, non-technical challenges uh, of, of IT impacting organisations. Uh, it's about 90 minutes, you'll come out of that session with a really clear understanding of Microsoft's offering. Uh, you'll understand the art of the possible uh, in, in terms of what we can do for you. Uh, and we can look at some of the, the, the cultural changes, if you like, that IT is, is, uh, is bringing to uh, not just the education sector, but, but, across, uh, but across all sectors. So I, I'd like to personally invite you to, to do that. Okay, um, I, I fear my question may expose the fact that I haven't been paying proper attention to my previous experience of your products and so on. But I, I actually do have a SkyDrive or OneDrive account as it is now. And so a wee bit of familiarity with the online version of uh, Word uh, and, and, and Office. But I hadn't, I hadn't thought it was 365 Office. So does 365 Office differ significantly from what I have been using uh, via s simply having an account with OneDrive? Is, is that in effect what a, one, a 365 ex Office experience w will, will give? Or is it something added on to that? I mean, I, I appreciate there were many other things you were talking about which are plainly sure, yes, added yes, on to that. Yeah. So. So, so Office 365, as I say, is the brand name for our productivity and collaboration suite. Uh, and as I said before, sometimes naming it Office 365 associates it with Word, Excel, PowerPoint, etc. There's a lot more functionality in there that, as we've described. Um, you do get access to the browser-based versions of Word, Excel, PowerPoint yes. within your SkyDrive, uh, OneDrive. OneDrive service, uh, which you can then open in any browser and edit and yes. co-collaborate so other people can collaborate at the same time. That's, that's, that's not full-featured. Yes. That's not full-featured, but you can create format documents. Typically, people creating a, a sta standard document, etc., they use it, that they'll use uh, the, the features there and be happy with them. If you want the full features, then, then that's the client, and we can use Office 365 to deliver that full client experience to the local device. So we're using that as a product, a platform to do that. So there's lots of bits in there. Does that, does that answer it or? I think it does. Yeah, yeah. Can okay. I, I can just say a word? Interesting enough, actually, Office 365 is, is quite commonly misunderstood. But really, Office 365 is just modern Office. But by going down the Office 365 route, you're out of the upgrade game. So you'll never again need to upgrade Office. It just happens in the background. So the upgrades are streamed in the background. Uh, the, the way you pay for it is different. No longer will you be buying a license. You'll be subscribing to Office. So I would encourage you, if you don't subscribe to Office, it's seven pounds a month. Uh, I have it at home. So my, my wife's Macintosh. It's my kids' laptops. It's my home PC. Uh, and it's always up to date. It's always available. And it's, it's a, a fantastic move forward. So I encourage you yeah. to try it out. But just to be clear, Office 365 is the platform. It includes a lot of modules, including the ability to deliver the Office suite. And that module in Office 365 is called Office Pro Plus. And that's what we're delivering to the students for no cost. And unfortunately, it's, it's chargeable for staff, but that's, that's just part of the whole productivity platform. Does that? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Well, I think that's probably all we have time for. Lunch is been served as we speak um, and I think we should just show our appreciation thanking Alan and thank uh, Mark from thank you very uh, much. Microsoft. Thank you for your time today. Appreciate it. Uh,